Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Enter every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. We're in a time of troubled breasts. Take away our bent to sinning, Alpha and Omega B. End of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. O oh, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Gracious God, as we move to this text, and we're going to take a look at it, and we need to know that it is your spirit that fills us with both wonder, love, and grace. Let it speak to us in a way, O oh God, that encourages us to be free from our bent to sinning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read the text, and I know it's a short text for the sermon, but uh, you need to keep your Bibles close at hand because we're going to look at something else. Just You don't have to necessarily keep that place, but have it ready. Paul writes to these followers of Jesus in the area of Galatia, and there are several congregations, evidently, if you get that from the beginning of the letter. And by the way, we're looking at that letter for the next uh, four weeks. We continue looking at it for the next four weeks during the Sunday school hour. And I invite you to come and join with us in our discussion. But he writes to these people because he's concerned about the fact that uh, they seem to be uh, returning to where they were. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're returning to the exact place. It's just returning to that way of life. And so Paul writes to these people whom he loves, and he says, you need to understand, for freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Subject is freedom. And it's a word we like to throw around, and we like to throw it around in particular when we are thwarted in doing what we want to do, especially when we want to do it. It was a word that I liked to use in growing up. When I was a teen living in my father's house, I liked to talk about being free, especially when dad decided that he needed to give a speech about the responsibility of living in his house. I would throw that word freedom or some variation of it out as he was winding down on his speech, and then I would begin to mumble my little protest. Just wait till I leave home. I'll be free to do what I want, when I want. And usually Dad just grinned and walked away. And then I got a job. We called it public work then. I don't know what they call it now, but I worked at a grocery store at IGA and Murray on the north side. Some of y'all shopped there. Some of y'all only, it's where Murray Home and Auto is now. 
And then after I got the job, I got married, and then I had children. And each of those experiences were moments of transformation of my understanding of freedom. And I began to understand that freedom really is tied up in and is more about responsibility than it is anything else. And what I've discovered in my 30 plus something years of trying to serve in the church is that as followers of Jesus, true freedom is the responsibility of loving others as though they are ourselves. And that it's a gift given to everyone by God, the author of all that exists, the creator of all things, And that that's what Paul stresses when he's preaching his gospel. And so Paul, who established the congregations in the Galatian community, he writes to all those communities of faith there and he says to them, as they're trying to make themselves worthy of God's grace by resubmitting to slavery, Paul writes, you need to understand it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Well, I read that for freedom Christ has set us free, and I have to ask, because I'm a question asker, free for what and from what? And what does Paul mean by freedom when he uses it and he stresses it so strongly? So I do what we all need to do in the church, and I begin to look at Scripture again, and I begin to look a little closer at this letter that Paul pins to us, and it is to us as much as it was to the people in Paul's day in the mid-first century. Paul says, listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, and that was an issue, If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, this is what I hear. If you try to make yourself worthy by doing or not doing something, you are rejecting the gift of God in Christ that God has given you. You're saying no. And then Paul goes on to write, Once again I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey, to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now I take it this way. If you are going to do the work of making yourself worthy of God's grace, and that's all the circumcision meant, that's all certain things mean, worthy of God's grace, then you're going to have to carry the whole load yourself. Because you have rejected God's grace, and God's grace is nothing less than Christ himself. You have said no to Christ by trying to make yourself worthy, by doing or not doing whatever. Certain things. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, Paul goes on to say. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. And this is the important part we need to remember, this part right here. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Faith working through love. That is the only thing that counts in our relationship with God. Those are key words for those of us who struggle to be faithful in our discipleship. And I stress the word struggle. As we struggle to follow Christ. Faith, which the writer of Hebrews says is, and I quote King James here, 
the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I like the way the message treats the Greek text when it says the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living, and that's what faith is. That firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. But let us not ignore the environment in which our faith in Christ works. It is faith working through love. Another little word we like to throw around, and I think sometimes we throw it around as though it had little to no meaning, but yet it is the most powerful word and powerful force in all of creation. Love. And if indeed it is, and it is the most powerful word in all of creation, or force. Let us return to Paul, who helps us understand what he means when he uses the word love. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles now, if you have your Bible, or if you have one, there's a pew Bible there. Turn to a letter that Paul wrote that talks about love. Now in the first service I asked for a response, it's not a rhetorical question, what might we turn to in the New Testament in one of Paul's letters the where he talks about love a whole lot. Now, because he talks about love everywhere. What might we turn to? Speak louder. 1 Corinthians 13. My wife cheated. First Corinthians 13. Now, what we need to understand about this letter of 1 Corinthians is that it is an undisputed letter of Paul. And that's important for us to understand. When I mean undisputed, that means that the vast majority of scholars, and those are people who struggle and wrestle with the text, not just read it and say, I think it means this, but these are people who, I mean, they, they're, they're like Jacob on the, river, on, on the banks of the river uh, Jabbok and, you know, wrestling with God all night long. They wrestle with these things. The vast majority of all scholars, whether they be liberal or conservative, they all agree Paul wrote this letter. Okay? They all agree this is Paul's stuff. Okay? Now he had just been, but Paul in this letter to the Corinthian church, he had been uh, chastising them somewhat and he had been helping them understand that, yeah, gifts are important. So, you know, like tongues and healings and preaching and all of that. And he said all of those things. But if you really want to know the most excellent way, he says, you need to understand the gifts don't mean anything unless you live the most excellent way. And this is what he says is the most excellent way. He says, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then he says, this is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love is not boastful. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. There are a few Walmart people who need us to hear that. Love is not rude. And notice I said they need for us to hear it. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never, ever ends. All the prophecies are going to come to an end. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, it will come to an end. What we know now is only in part, and we prophesy only... A little bit of stuff, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. 
But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now faith and hope and love live these three. But understand this, the greatest of the three is love. Faith working through love. No matter what we do in life, if we do not have the faith to do it with God's love, as it is poured out into us by the Spirit of God, and I still kind of like what I grew up with by the Holy Ghost, as we used to say. If we do not have the faith to do it, what we do with the love of God, with God's love, that same Spirit that is found in Christ Jesus, then we gain nothing. We are indeed, as the text says, nothing more than a clanging gong. But then again, I like the way the message translates the Greek. We are nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. I grew up with rusty gates, and they don't sound good. They're nerve-wracking drive you insane. We do our stuff without the same love that God has for us, without God's love. Then we are nothing more than that nerve-wracking, creaky, rusty gate sound. Without the love of God poured into the world by God's Son, what we believe about Christ, what we believe about the church, what we believe about God, what we believe about baptism or communion, about life or about right or wrong. If we, if we come to all these conclusions and we, we don't do it out of the, the love that God has poured onto us and into us through Christ and in Christ, then all of that stuff means nothing. God's grace is God's love. One does not exist without the other. We do not exist without the love and the grace of God. We have before us this morning a meal that Christ has prepared for us and shares with us out of the love that he has for us. And this meal is extremely important. So when the time comes and you approach this altar rail and you receive these elements of bread and wine, understand that it's nothing less than the very love of God that you're receiving. <laughs>